Welcome to the Henry Street Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible class. It's with great enthusiasm that we welcome you to this session tonight as we continue to study the uh, book of Romans. Excuse me, let me get it out correctly. So again, we're studying the book of Romans. We're going to be talking about part number eight tonight, which is let God be true in every man a liar. So as always, if you've been faithful to these broadcasts, we are certainly glad that you continue to come back and study with us. And we always want you to know you have an open invitation to study with us on Wednesday nights here, right in Facebook Live at 7 p.m. Central Time every Wednesday night. But you have an even better invitation to come see us in person um, as we meet at the following address, 309 Henry Street, in the city of Gadsden, Alabama, 35901 is our zip code. And of course, you can find more information about us at our website, which is www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com. It's uh, maintained by uh, Brother Tanikas Vanderburg, a faithful member of the church that does a good job at uh, keeping the news on there and uh, pertinent videos and um just whatever you can think of related to the church, the address, etc., is there for you to take advantage of. Uh, but again, on Sunday mornings, we meet at 10 a.m. Central Time, again, in the city of Gadsden, Alabama. So come check us out. You'll enjoy the worship, but most of all, you'll worship the right way. Because we are Christians, I believe in John 4, verse 24, where the Bible says that God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we're going to give you... Spirit-filled and truthful worship. Spirit-filled means that it comes from the inside out. Not here to put on a show or um, put on gimmicks and those kind of type of things, but to literally give God worship with all of our heart. That's the best way probably of saying what worship in the Spirit is. And with truth, that is only according to New Testament Christianity. That's a major mistake that people make today. They don't realize what Colossians 2 verse 14, Hebrews 12 verse 24 says. That is, that we're under a new covenant. You know, there are many covenants in the Bible. The first one being with Adam and Eve, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They broke that covenant. Um, we also had the covenant with Moses, which is called the Old Testament or the Law of Moses. That law expired. That is, God replaced it with the New Testament when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. Colossians 2.14 and Hebrews 12.24 teaches us that. So that's why we worship the way that we do. If you come and visit us or you watch our broadcast. Uh, on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Central, you'll notice that uh, we only worship according to the way that God has uh, provided it, put down the blueprint, the plan for it in the New Testament. So we're going to differ quite a bit from what you see in popular media. You know, we're going to always uh, take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week because Acts 20 verse number seven is the precedent. The church in the first century took the, the, uh, the Lord's Supper the first day of the week so we're going to continue to do that following the blueprint um we you know of course we pray as the first century church did uh we sing um we listen to the lord's word and we take the offering all five parts of the worship are going to be done every sunday because that's the way jesus put it down in the new covenant also known as the new testament as far as our worship so that's why we worship in spirit and in truth Again, truth means the way that God wants it done. Uh, but nonetheless, I didn't want to get off on that side track. I just kind of want to explain some things to you. If uh, you see our worship service or you participate in it, and it's a little different than what you see in the mainstream media, but you got to realize mainstream media doesn't mean they have a connection with God. You know, just because you're saying Jesus is your Lord doesn't mean that he is. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7 verse 21, Not everybody that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will. Of my Father, which is in heaven. But let me get back on track here and get back to the lesson here again. Tonight, our topic is going to be the book of Romans, part number eight. Uh, it's going to be entitled, Let God Be True and Every Man a Liar, based on the scriptures that we're studying tonight. Um, one more thing before we get deep into our lesson tonight. Just please remember that we do record these sessions and we post them on our YouTube channel. So all you have to do is go to www.youtube.com, type in my name, Anthony L. Norwood, or Jesus is Lord, or the Henry Street Church of Christ, and make sure you look for my picture because there's some duplication on YouTube uh, where people have the same name as myself. But you'll see me in a black suit and in the red tie, and that's definitely going to be me. 
and the banner at on top of our page being Bible Study Series. And of course, when you come to our site, our home page on YouTube, you're going to see the latest videos. Not only do we record the sessions tonight every Bible study, but we uh, post a video every day. Uh, we have a daily devotional called One Minute Inspirations in which we post a video that's one to three minutes uh, max there, typically by 7 p.m. Central Time every day. And so it's going to be like basically a mini bite, a mini lesson uh, to inspire you, to encourage you, to instruct you upon that day. So I encourage you to come out to our YouTube site and subscribe to it. So when you log into YouTube in your own account, you get a notification uh, that we posted our daily video. But also, uh, we ask that you share and like the videos because in doing so, you're going to help spread the word of God throughout the planet. Uh, it's very easy to spread the word of God now electronically. You can do it within seconds and be 10,000 miles away to people you may have never known. So I encourage you, use those buttons. Use these videos um, and use them to spread the word of God to your friends, your family, your co-workers, and anybody else. Because all people need salvation. And you can be an ally. Think about yourself as being a mail carrier, a courier, however you want to call it. And you're just delivering the word of God. Be part of that force of couriers of God's word uh, by, again, subscribing to the channel, liking, and sharing the videos. One more thing in regards to organization of the site. Uh, we have over 1,100 videos there because we have been doing it since uh, 2016. Uh, so we've organized them using YouTube's format, which is called the playlist. Playlist is nothing but categories that you make and assign to your various videos. We have 19 categories at last count, and they're based on different topics. As you can see, I have uh, outlined on your screen here in this video that we have a playlist called Romans, which is the book of Romans. So as we continue to progress through the book of Romans, we're going to put each video there, typically within 24 hours of it being delivered live here on Facebook Live. Again, you also see the One Minute Inspiration. That's a daily devotional series I've already discussed to you or described to you, excuse me. And you also have more advanced topics like creation versus evolution. You have the Gospel of John, which is the book we've already completed. If you want to go through uh, the Gospel of John from verse, opening verse to closing verse, you'll be there. We're going to do the same thing with Romans and any others that God allows us to do. We're going to post on here in its own category, again, called a playlist. you got other things like marriage, divorce, and rem uh, marriage. you got um, sound doctrine and so on with many other um, categories for you to learn at your own pace. Remember the good thing about the Internet, good thing about YouTube is that it never shuts down. It's 24 hours, seven days a week, so you can learn at your own pace. Especially if you're joining us for the first time here tonight and you want to stay in this series with Romans, uh, you can look at the previous uh, week's lessons there on your own time as well. All right, so with that being said, let's go ahead and get into the message here today. Uh, thank you all again for joining us. Um, I see many familiar faces here, and uh, I know some people from overseas, even though we're in the United States, often join us. Uh, Malawi's often on with us. Um, Nigeria's often here. Uganda's often here. Um, our brethren from the Philippines are often here and uh, other uh, nations here. So we appreciate their support in uh, being a part of these Bible studies as well. And we're wishing for God's speed and success. We're praying for for all of your ministries uh, overseas as well. So now we are in Romans chapter number three. We're starting with verse 3 and verse number 4, and I'm going to read out of the King James Version, and then we're going to study this block of text going forward, okay? So I encourage you to read along with me, and we'll absorb uh, the Word of God and take root in our heart accordingly. All right, Romans chapter 3, verse 3 and verse number 4. Remember the background. This is a letter from the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul to the Church of Christ that met in, in Rome in the first century, Okay? And so remember, the letters from Paul became books of the Bible, and this is no exception. So the book of Romans is really a massive letter that was written to the Christian community that was gathering in the city of Rome in the Roman Empire of the time. And of course, there's two things always going on in Paul's writings. Remember, he always was dealing with a 
group of people that came from the Jewish religion, also known as Judaism, those that were followers of the law of Moses. And he always had to make sure they understood that they made the right decision and to stay in that right decision, that is to follow Christ and not try to go back to uh, Judaism, uh, the law of Moses, and just to stay the course till they die to stay in Christ and follow him and follow him exclusively. So he's always comparing and contrasting the law of Moses, meaning the Old Testament, as opposed to the New Covenant, also known as the New Testament, that was given to us by Jesus when he died on the cruel cross of Calvary. So you always got to have these things in mind when you read the scriptures and you understand why he often references the law of Moses in the Old Testament and shows that faith in Christ, which is faith in the New Testament, is superior to the Old Testament law of Moses. Okay, And you also have to keep in mind that in the early stages of the church, meaning the first century, um, you often had conflicts that would arise between those that came from a Jewish background and became Christians as opposed to those that came from not a non-Jewish background and became Christians. You would have conflicts sometimes in the church. And so Paul's letters were always designed to create unity and get rid of the arrogance that can develop in the midst of Christians that come from different backgrounds before they became Christians. And typically he targeted the Jewish mindset to make sure that they did not uh, gain or keep a superiority complex because they were the people of God. And now God has made them and the Gentiles, meaning the non-Jewish people for, uh, that became Christians, one, and that there be no superiority between the two groups. But they're all one in Christ. All would have the same salvation and neither will have um, superiority or a greater salvation than the other, but the same salvation when all is said and done. So that is the background leading up to Romans chapter 3, verse 3, and verse number 4. And now, right now, he's dealing with the Christian community that came from a Jewish background. Okay? So think about this. Romans 3, verse 3, and verse number 4. He is addressing those from a Jewish background. Okay? All right, so let's read it. It says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Again, that's Romans chapter 3, verse 3, verse number 4, King James Version. All right, looking at those two verses, and starting with Romans chapter 3, verse number 3, again, Paul is speaking of the Jews who did not, who did not believe in the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ, because you got to remember that even when Jesus walked on the face of the earth, the majority of Jewish people rejected him and his ministry, which was rejecting the word of God. Okay? All right, so Paul is addressing that. So Paul is demonstrating that unbelief of mankind does not nullify the truth of God's word. In other words, just because you have a lot of people that reject God's word does not change the fact that God's word is the truth, no matter what. OK, you know, because see, if you think about it, you know, we can relate to that as American citizens because we believe in democracy and majority rule. OK, and so when a large portion of us, I'm talking about the American people, so you understand the mindset, believe in something, we automatically assume that it's the truth just because the majority of people believe in it. But that's not necessarily the truth. OK, that's not necessarily that's not how God works. OK. Because there could be 2 million people that object against what God says and God alone is standing there teaching the truth. The majority becomes God, not the people that don't believe. Okay? So this is what he is saying. He's saying no matter how many people uh, object to the New Testament, no matter how many people object to Jesus as the Lord and Savior, it does not change the fact that Jesus is King of Kings. Jesus is Lord of Lords, Jesus is Judge of Mankind, and Jesus is the Savior that came to save all mankind, Jew and Gentile alike, and there's nothing no one can do to change that. There is going to be no other Savior given to man except Jesus, okay? Not even Moses, 
who uh, gave us the Old Testament can say man because Moses' blood means nothing when it comes to being a sacrifice for the sins of mankind. Only the blood of Jesus, Revelation chapter 1, verse number 5, is the sacrifice that God accepts for all of the sins that we have committed so that we can have the forgiveness of our sins. In other words, he died in our stead, in our place, so that we don't have to answer for the sins that we have committed on the judgment day. Okay? So again, going back to the gospel. Again, that gospel is that Jesus is the Son of God who suffered, died, and rose again so that we may have a chance at eternal life. He paid the price for our sins. The ransom has been paid for the debt we owe to God for our sins. Okay, so Paul is demonstrating that the unbelief of mankind in what I just told you, the good news of salvation through Christ, does not change the fact that God's word is the truth. Okay, in fact, Paul is telling us that if the opinions of mankind differ from the New Testament truth of the Bible, then we are to regard those who do not agree as the true liars and never go against the word of God. So again, that's why we name this lesson tonight. Let God be true in every man a liar. This is the lesson that Paul is bringing unto the people in Romans chapter number three. Remember the integrity of God as well. Titus chapter one, verse number two. God cannot lie. And of course, Second Timothy three, verse 16 and verse number 17 shows us that the Bible is his word. So that means the Bible is true because it came through a true source. The Bible is not flawed because it came from somebody who is unflawed. The Bible is completely 100% morally correct because it came from a complete 100% morally correct source who is God, who cannot lie. All right. So thus, this is the conclusion that we come to knowing this information. If it is written in the Bible, then it is nothing but the truth. If you believe that, somebody say amen. Type in amen. See, we must hail God through his word as the truth, no matter how many people argue against him and his word. Again, what Romans chapter 3, verse 3 and verse number 4 is teaching us tonight. All right, lastly, again, in our evaluation of Romans chapter 3 and verse number 4, Romans chapter 4 is actually quoting Psalm chapter 51, verse number 4. Now, remember, the Old Testament is always used, as I call it, the, as the proof text of the truth of the New Testament. In other words, the Old Testament is is the evidence that the New Testament is true. And that's why you see Paul going back and um, referring to the Old Testament. You know, he does that frequently throughout his letters, especially when dealing with the Jewish back, uh, people from a Jewish background, because remember they had the Hebrew Bible, which were the books of Genesis to Malachi that we call the Old Testament. So obviously then that means that whatever Paul is saying, they can go back and study it for themselves. OK, so again, Psalm 51, verse number four is what Paul is quoting when he's talking about Romans three, verse four. And I put this here for your convenience. Romans chapter 51, verse four says that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome what thou art judge. Now, who is the thou? In other words, who is the you? Who is the psalmist talking about in Psalm 51, verse number four? He's talking about God. OK, God is the subject of Psalm chapter 51. OK. So what this means is when you look at Psalm 51, verse number four, uh, God is talking about his own integrity. The psalmist is talking about the integrity of God, the honesty of God. OK, so this is a statement meaning that God is always right and will prove blameless anytime mankind tries to prove him as false. OK, so in other words, God will prevail against any arguments that try to paint him as evil, that try to paint him as a liar, that tries to put man's philosophies and opinions over him, every time those things will be defeated because of the integrity of God himself. Again, Psalm 51 verse 4 is quoted. It says that, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings. You are right in everything that you say. And mightest overcome when thou art judged. In other words, when man tries to look down on God, he always prevails against them because they cannot out-argue God. He is divine. Man is like an ant under a, a person's boot. He has no power to overpower God in any form or fashion. God will prevail over him in logic, in understanding, in power, anything you can think of because that's why he is ca called God Almighty. All power resides in his hand. We don't have the intelligence to outsmart God. Okay? 
All right, that moving on, if you understand that, somebody type in, I understand. All right, so let's move on to Romans chapter 3, verse 5 to verse number 8. And it reads as follows. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather as we would as as we be slanderously reported, excuse me, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Now, I'm going to show you that as Paul writes to the church of Christ in Rome, he's also addressing the objections that the Jewish mind comes up with. OK, so he's thinking ahead because the Holy Spirit is helping him to deal with objections that the Jewish community would have according to the teachings of the New Testament. In other words, what they would not really like to hear coming from the New Testament. He's going to address them as we continue to read the chapter. OK. All right. So let's look at this uh, slowly here in verse number five. Romans 3 verse number 5 says, But if our righteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. Now, Romans chapter 3 verse number 5, I think uh, a good translation to understand the thought. Remember, New Living Translation is not, is not a version that is word for word, but tries to translate the thought of what's being said. Okay? And it does do a good job in this case. Okay? Now, Romans 3, verse number 5, according to New Living Translation, makes it clear what Paul is saying. The word of God is saying through Paul. It says, but some might say our sinfulness serves a good purpose, for it helps people see how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair then for him to punish us? This is merely a human point of view. Okay, so this is the Jewish people. They're objecting to them being sinful. Remember, when we read the first chapters, Romans chapter 1 to chapter 2, all the way up to Romans chapter number 3, Paul has laid down the groundwork showing that the Jewish people have been evil throughout their uh, lifespans, you know, since Adam and Eve, and so has the Gentile people. And Paul's going to continue to stress that everybody has been sinful, no matter if they come from a Jewish background or they come from a non-Jewish background. All of us have done that which has uh, that that has brought God's anger upon us by our own merit, um, that has made God disappointed with us, that has made God angry with us, and we have earned his uh, eternal punishment before Christ saved us. Okay? He's showing us all mankind as a human race, no matter what his nationality may be. He has done evil. Okay? So now the Jewish people are, are trying, you know, to argue with Paul and saying that, OK, fine, we're evil, but our evil showed the world how good God is. OK, and if that is the case, we have done something good. So why should God punish us? That's the logic that the Jewish people are trying to use against the word of God being presented. Now, that doesn't make sense at all. OK, how do you get good out of evil? You cannot get good out of evil. That's what they're arguing. Our bad has created good. No, it cannot. Bad creates bad. That's all it is to it. Right. So there's nothing to it. I mean, think about a glass of water. If it's a dirty glass of water, and you keep adding dirt to it. What's going to happen to the water? The water is going to continue. The more and more dirt you add to it, the more mud you're going to get out of it. In other words, you can't put dirt in it and expect clean water. It doesn't work. OK, and that's what the Jewish people are trying to argue. Our dirt that we have done in the world has made God look good. No, it does not. It makes God look evil because they were representatives of God. And so when people look at the Jewish community, when you look at Genesis to Malachi, how evil they were, it made a lot of people that were not Jewish not want to even worship God because they figured that if the Jewish people are going to be like that, God is that way, too. Same thing happens with us as Christians. You know, if we don't act right, you know, we don't uh, be godly in this world. We live as hypocrites. Then we make Jesus look bad. OK, so let's let me back up a little bit now. Again, let's read back uh, verse number five. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? 
Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. Again, Romans 3 verse 5, New Living Translation says, But some might say our sinfulness serves a good purpose, for it helps people see how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair then for him to punish us? This is merely a human point of view. So here again, Paul is going to debunk this argument from the Jewish people. This logic does not make sense. Our sinfulness cannot prove God's righteousness. If that point makes sense to you, type in, I understand. You see, God is righteous because he is perfect without us. We don't have to prove God is righteous. We don't have to prove God as being somebody of integrity. We don't have to prove that God is uh, holy in all ways because he's all those things whether we live or not. He's all those things no matter what we do. He doesn't need us to prove how good and righteous he is because he is. He is the great I am. He exists in all these things because he is all of that <laughs> by nature. Okay, that's the best way I can explain it. So again, he does not need to compare himself against us to show us that he is better than us. Okay, he is completely able to judge us because he will do it in righteousness and not hypocrisy. Okay, so these are all the arguments, you know, in a nutshell that Paul is making against the Jewish argument that our bad made good. It doesn't make sense. Okay. All right. So let's go on to verse number six. All right. King James Version reads again. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? So going on to Romans 3 verse 6. God is showing the Jewish people that it is unacceptable to think of their sins as serving a good purpose. Sin never serves a good purpose, okay? Our good deeds serve a good purpose for others to imitate, imitate instead. That part is good, okay? When we do good things, it bring, brings glory to God. It brings praise to God. That's what Matthew 5 or 16, that famous verse of the Bible says. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and what? Glorify your Father, which is in heaven. However, if they see our bad deeds, it does what? It causes them to blaspheme God. It's the opposite. In other words, to speak evil about him. So, folks, the argument Paul is making in verse number six is that God would not be able to judge the world in righteousness if he allowed the hypocritical Jewish men to go unpunished for their deeds. In other words, he's going to deal with their evil so that their evil does not hinder the good name of God. Okay. So in other words, he could not send the non-Jewish hypocrite to hell without sending the Jewish one there too. Okay? That would be totally unfair of God. So God is showing, and remember again, we're talking about Romans chapter 1 and chapter number 2. He's showing that all mankind, Jewish and non-Jewish, have been evil throughout their existence. Since the uh, partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all mankind has been evil. Okay? Uh, as a human race. So uh, Paul is showing us that God will judge all mankind. Okay. And he's going to do it fairly. You know, being Jewish, it does not give them privileges of not being judged if they're living as hypocrites. Being a non-Jew does not mean that they'll have any privileges at all. You know, because we all have to come to Christ in faith and live the Christian life to be saved. No more, no less. OK. Otherwise, God wouldn't be a fair judge to give the Jewish people a pass and the non-Jewish people no pass when they both are doing the same things, which is sin. OK. All right. So verse number seven and verse number eight. When you understand somebody say amen. All right. So Romans chapter three, going on to verse seven and verse number eight says. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory. Why yet am I also judged as a sinner, and not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Now, let's look at Romans chapter 3, verse 7, and verse number 8, and see what God is really saying. Okay, so take it slow. Paul is still in these two verses, verse 7 and verse number 8, applying the same logic to the conversation. He is showing that unrighteousness cannot demonstrate the righteousness of God and cause the offender to be released from the judgment of God to come. Okay? Again, God is fair because he judges us on our own individual righteousness. 
He demands righteous behavior out of us with no excuses we can give to justify ourselves. Remember, that's what Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 23 is talking about on the judgment day. Just verse number 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Okay? That applies to Jewish and non-Jewish Christians alike. We all have to obey just as much as we believe in order to be saved. In other words, they both go together. Faith and obedience are necessary for our salvation. All right, so let's go on to Romans 3, verse 9, and verse number 18. Uh, a bigger chunk of scriptures to go through, but we're going to take them and then we're going to divide them out a little bit so it's not so much at one time. But let's read it all the way through because we want to understand the whole mindset of God, the whole idea of what he's trying to teach. And then we look at it in detail. All right, so the King James Version reads in Romans chapter 3, verse 9, and verse number 18. It says, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of apps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Romans chapter 3, verse 9 and verse 18, again, from the King James Version. All right, so now let's look at these verses 9 to 13. Okay, I'm going to read it again. I know it's repetitive, but it's on purpose. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Now Paul makes sure... Here, as we understand these verses, we bring out the meaning of the words. He makes sure that the Jewish mind does not think it is spiritually superior to the non-Jewish person, as explained earlier. The reasoning is that because all mankind has sinned, no one has the right to boast about their own personal righteousness. None of us, uh, no matter what background we come from, have lived to the point without Christ that we're righteous enough for God to accept us. And this is what he's trying to show the Jewish people who often got became, that is, became spiritually arrogant as if they deserved heaven, as if they have earned it, when in fact they were sinful and everything that they did would keep them out of heaven. They needed a savior just like everyone else, okay? Because again, all have sinned. Remember, that's one of the reasons why Jesus had such a hard time uh, drawing in the scribes and the Pharisees, the Jewish leadership, um, to his ministry to accept him as the Lord and Savior because they thought they were right and they could do nothing wrong. A lot of the Jewish people had that mentality as well that by because by blood I'm a Jewish person, I'm automatically saved. That does not mean that because God goes beyond blood ties of being Jewish to that which is spiritual, meaning you got to live the life of someone that's righteous in God's sight. These are the whole lessons that Paul is teaching. Remember too, that Paul is Jewish originally. He was a Pharisee. All of those things. So he knows what he's talking about because he came from that same exact background that he's speaking to. So he knows the spiritual arrogance that the Jewish mind could develop and the self-righteous mentality that they could develop because, remember, he came from that Jewish background. So he's able to deal with it. Like we like to say the old saying, he's been there, done that. He understands it. OK, now in this passage of scripture, going back to Romans chapter three, verse nine, verse number 18, Paul quotes again the Old Testament. He quotes Psalm chapter 14, verse one to verse number three and Psalm chapter 53, verse one to verse number three to prove that mankind has always been corrupt, no matter our nationalities, as mentioned earlier. OK, all right. Go back to verse number 13. He writes, their throat is an open sepulcher. 
With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Poison of asp means a snake. All right, so Romans chapter 3, verse 13 tells us, The problem that all mankind has demonstrated is dishonesty. We all have been dishonest at some point in our lives. Now, God concludes that both Jewish and non-Jewish people are guilty of this sin. It can, contain, it can contain the poison of a snake, figuratively speaking. It can cause death to those who use it incorrectly. In fact, God tells us that no unrepentant liar will ever make it into heaven. Revelation 21 verse number 27 shows us that liars will always be excluded from heaven if they don't repent. That is, stop lying. All right, so moving forward. Verse number 14 says, and this is Romans 3 verse 14 whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Now, even more, the tongues of all mankind have verbalized countless numbers of curses and bitter words. Now, remember, cursing in the Bible means to wish harm on other people. All right? So this means that mankind is ever wishing harm upon others and spewing forth hatred. That's what bitter words mean, hatred. Okay? Because remember, Jesus told us to love our neighbor as ourselves. However, the majority of people in this world that has ever lived have hated their neighbor, okay, instead of loving them and have cursed them. In other words, wanted to see harm unto them instead of uh, righteousness. That's why you can see things like we have the war going on with uh, uh, the Russians and Ukraine. You can see how the Russians can easily attack Ukraine, um, bomb hospitals, um, you know, shoot people down in the street, kill, kill men, woman, and child without any remorse is because they have that spirit of Satan in them. You know, they're following orders from um, a satanic uh, source, okay, being their leadership in, Ru in Russia. So obviously then they're spewing down curses all the time. They're cursing uh, through, their, um, through their words. Uh, the Ukrainian people, and they're spilling out hatred against them, which are bitter words. So that's a good example of that inaction in our day and age in this year 2022 of the war in Ukraine. Okay, and you can see that in everything. You can go back to World War II in the 40s with Adolf Hitler and how he uh, hated Jews and sent millions of them to their deaths. Uh, because why? He wished harm on them. He cursed them. And also what? Bitter words. He spewed hatred against them to move the Jewish people to... I slaughter them in mass numbers uh, to their shame. Okay, I'm talking about to the shame of the German people of the time. All right, so let's continue on. But remember, it's not just the Germans, not just the Russians. Um, you see that in, you know, a lot of the conquests throughout Africa, um, uh, any continent you can think of, uh, the, uh, South America, United States itself, and what we did to the Native Americans. <laughs> you know, just think about it. That's the nature of people. To curse and use bitter words against others in order for their um, hatred to be enacted on people. Okay? All right, so let's continue on then. Verse number 15. Uh, he's talking about humanity now. Jews and Gentiles alike. Uh, what they're like. And this actually goes along with the comments that were just made. It says, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. So in, in addition, mankind as a whole is guilty of being quick to murder others in cold blood. You see, that didn't happen. I mean, it didn't take very long for that to come into the world, right? Look at that, Cain and Abel. You know, <laughs> you have the first human beings on the earth, you know, Adam and Eve's children. Um, the first murder being committed almost immediately, <laughs> you know, since they got on uh, the face of the planet. So you can see how Satan can get in the hearts of people and allow them to shed blood without any guilt or any remorse to it uh, and destroy and create misery everywhere. So again, mankind as a human race, we bring destruction and suffering upon others. Romans chapter 3, verse 15 and verse number 16. Okay? When we're not following Christ. All right. So let's go to verse 17 now. It says, And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is basically repeating what we're saying. You see, those that are controlled by Satan, you know, influenced by Satan. Okay? Buying into all of the evil things Satan wants them to think and do. Okay? Because Satan can't make them do anything. They have to choose to do it. But what I mean by that is that they're controlled by Satan because they're allowing Satan to influence them to do all these bad things. So these people, the human race, they do not know how to live with, with others in peace. Again, this is the mark of being influenced by Satan. Only those who are peacemakers are the, true of, uh, are the children of God. Let me say it again. 
Only those who are peacemakers are the children of God, according to what Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 9. So if you want to be a peacemaker, excuse me, you want to be a child of God, you got to be a peacemaking soul. Okay? That's just point blank. We really can't um, make that e more clear than what it is. Okay? So the reason being for so much hatred and evil in mankind is that they have the wrong attitude toward God. Now, this is what he's talking about. Remember, that's what verse 18 is getting to where it says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. In other words, they have no respect for God at all. Thus, they will not submit to his authority, calling them to live righteously. Now, we're talking about the human race. Instead, they will do what is right in their own eyes, which is truly evil according to God's standards. Romans 3, verse 17 and verse number 18. All right, getting closer to closing out here. Uh, let's go to Romans chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, as I know time is getting away from us. When you understand the word of God, somebody say amen. All right, so Romans chapter 3, verse 19 and verse number 20 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Again, Romans 3, verse 19 and 20. King James Version. All right, I'm not going to read verse 19 to 20 again, but uh, let's discuss it. Here, Paul continues in these verses by saying that the Old Testament law of Moses was speaking to those who are under that covenant. Okay? Of course, that meant the Jewish people historically and not the Gentiles. Okay? The law of Moses stops every mouth from bragging about his or her own personal righteousness because it convicts all who read it of sin. Okay, Romans 3 verse number 19. So again, what he's showing is that the law of Moses historically for the Jewish people was not a good thing for them. Okay, again, we know that the law of Moses is no longer in effect. We know we're not under the Old Testament because again, as I mentioned earlier, class of 2 verse 14, Hebrews 12 24, it was nailed to the cross with Jesus. Okay, and so we're under the New Testament instead. But again, he's trying to show the Jewish people that you're holding on to something that was not your friend. You're trying to hold on to the Old Testament law of Moses that actually was against you and was not helping you, okay? Because why? It exposes you of how bad you morally are in the sight of God. For example, a small portion of the law of Moses contains what is commonly called the, the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter number 20. Everyone who has ever lived has broken one of these Ten Commandments and is deemed a sinner accordingly. This is Paul's thought going into Romans chapter 3, verse number 20. That is, since all mankind is convicted as sinners when one compares his or her righteousness to what the Old Testament law of Moses commanded, no one can be justified by it in the sight of God. In other words, the Old Testament is not our friend either, even if we don't come from a Jewish background. Because again, it exposes all mankind, Jews and non-Jews alike, of how bad we need a Savior. Because our morality is so awful that we cannot get ourselves into the kingdom of God on our own without somebody dying for our sins. Okay? We take them away for God to give us forgiveness so that we can enter the pearly gates of heaven. That's why I remember um, I preached a lesson recently um, where Paul had said that our righteousness is like filthy rags. Remember filthy rags in the original Greek language means the rags that a woman uses for menstruation. In other words, that's how bad our righteousness looks to God. It looks gross to him of how bad that we sin. Okay, that's a graphic illustration of what God has been teaching us about sin and how much it disgusts him. All right. So again, when we go back and try to live the Old Testament, the Jews, and even today, some people uh, try to go back and live the Old Testament. We are all failures when it comes to that. We all are deemed unrighteous, unrighteous because no one has lived in perfection according to the law of Moses, except for Jesus Christ himself. He's the only one that lived in perfection. Hebrews 4, verse 14 and 15. All others are sinners. Okay, Romans 3, 23, Romans 6, verse 23 teaches us that. All right, so let's go to Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 26. When you understand what has been already said, somebody again say amen. All right, so Romans 3, verse 21 to verse number 26. It's going to be the last passage of the scripture we're going to study, I believe, before shutting down our lesson for the day. 
King James Version reads in Romans 3, verse 21 and 26. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all of them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Again, that's the rereading of Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to verse number 26. All right, verse 21 and 22, let's look at these in depth. It says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now, Romans 3, verse 21 begins to show us where one obtains righteousness in the sight of God. In other words, how we get real righteousness in God's sight. Okay, Romans 3, verse 21 starts to show us that. It is not by obeying the Old Testament law of Moses. It is through faith in Jesus Christ. This faith makes all mankind righteous, no matter his or her background. That's what Paul is teaching. Romans 3, verse 21. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. John 3, verse 16 and 17 shows us that faith in Christ makes us righteous. Now, remember, Paul is showing his Jewish audience that faith in Jesus Christ is what makes one righteous and not Jewish heritage. Jewish blood means nothing to God when it comes to salvation. Thus, both Jews and Gentiles are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 3, verse number 22. Remember that word justified means to be righteous in God's sight. It's how God views us when we are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. All right, I think that's enough tonight. Thank you very much. This is a very, very deep uh, passage of Scripture, very, very deep book of the Bible. If you enjoyed it, say, I enjoyed the lesson tonight. Um, so what I'm going to do again is to pause for a moment, and I want you to remember to continue to join us for our virtual Bible study here every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central Time here on Facebook Live. And again, don't forget to go to YouTube.com, type in Anthony L. Norwood, Henry Street Church of Christ, um, as another search term, and make sure you find my picture with a black suit and red tie, also known as Jesus is Lord there, to give honor to God on uh, YouTube, uh, where you'll see this lesson posted within 24 hours. And of course, again, we ask you to subscribe, like, and share the videos to help spread the word of God throughout this planet for man's salvation and also to help build up and strengthen the Christian community. Again, you have an open invitation to meet us in person in worship service and experience what worship in spirit and in truth really is. There is no other way to worship on the planet that's acceptable by God, and there'll be no other experience you will have like worshiping in the Lord's church in spirit and in truth. I guarantee you, you won't be disappointed if you come there with an open heart and open eyes to what the Word of God actually says, instead of what's popular out there but sinful in the world today. Uh, but also remember the plan of salvation. Uh, if you not, have not become a member of the Lord's church for your salvation, make sure you do before it's everlastingly too late. And I would say today, contact your local Church of Christ congregation uh, in your neighborhood, in your area, and I'm sure that the leadership there would be glad to uh, baptize you for the forgiveness of your sins, which I'm going to explain to you in a moment here. So what do you have to do to be saved? Well, the complete plan of salvation is six steps. It starts with step number one, which is hearing the word of God, Romans 10, verse number 17. We'll come to that later, but it says um, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Step two is the faith necessary to save you, which is that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And that being the case, you will accept his authority of your life, meaning that he's your Lord and Savior. Uh, you said in John 3, verse 16, where the Bible says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Step three in God's plan of salvation is about lifestyle. Okay? As you can see throughout our, our study here today, that God stresses obedience no matter what background you come from. God calls that repentance. Repentance means to obey God and leave a sinful lifestyle alone. You'll see Jesus commanded that in Luke 13, 3 and verse number 5. Peter repeated the same thing in Acts 2, verse 38. And of course, many other passages of Scripture show us that we must repent. That is, to turn our back on a sinful lifestyle and live righteous instead. Uh, the fourth part of the plan of salvation is what we must do with our mouths, which is called confession. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and verse number 10, which we'll study in depth later on, tells us that we must with the mouth confess Jesus as Lord. And that we must um, confess him as Lord in order to be saved. Again, that's Romans 10, verse 9 and verse number 10. You'll see the Ethiopian eunuch doing that as an example in Acts 8, verse 37, where he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And you must go down in the water grave of baptism where you go down your old self and rise a new creation where all your sins will be washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember, even Jesus himself in Matthew chapter number 3 was baptized to show us the way of righteousness. And since he was baptized, he commands us to do the same in water, just like he did at the hands of John the Baptist. He said in Mark chapter 16, verse number 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Uh, so again, that's the steps one through five of how to become a Christian. You got to hear the word of God, which is the New Testament, that testimony about Jesus being your Lord and Savior, the Son of God. Uh, you must uh, believe it concerning that, meaning your faith. Uh, repent of your sins, meaning to turn to God in your righteousness, leave a sinful lifestyle alone. You must, number four, confess Jesus as the Son of God, which means your Lord, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your souls. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Galatians 3, verse 27 shows us that that's when God adds us to Christ, which means the family of God, also known as the church. And of course, after that, you must remain that Christian that you started and pledged to be. That's what Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10, to the Christian community, he says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That is, we must stay faithful to God unto the very end of our lives. Let's finish what we started, continuing faith in Jesus as the Son of God and obedience to him as his disciple, meaning his followers, and heaven will be your home. If you have done anything wrong um, as a child of God, don't give up, don't give in, try again. That is, God gives you another opportunity through repentance, confession, and prayer. Acts 8, verse 22, 1 John 1, 7, verse number 10, in order to get right with God again, that he'll forgive you once again. Uh, again, please meet us at 10 a.m. Central Time on Sunday morning at the Henry Street Church of Christ, 309 Henry Street, Gaston, Alabama, 35901, www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com. We love you, but God loves you more. Uh, thank you for listening tonight and continue to share with us. Pray for us as we pray for you. Bye-bye.